Sexual Assault Response Team and Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Program Manager. So I work with the sexual assault response teams um, that exist in every county of the state, while also um, overseeing the victim notification components of the um, sexual assault kit initiative project, which is the work of um, working to eliminate the backlog of untested kits in Maryland. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about the neurobiology of trauma and a little bit about a trauma-informed response and some tips for working with survivors that have been affected by sexual assault and um, kind of how to work with them in a trauma-informed manner. A little bit of that will be at the end. Um, so <clears throat> Uh, if you have any questions, I really am not the biggest fan of like virtual virtual trainings because it's a little harder to engage for, compared to in-person ones, but um, that's the state of the world after COVID. So if you have any questions throughout the training, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'll also try and keep an eye on the Q&A box as well, and I'll try and answer those either as um, I go throughout the training or at the end at the very least. Um, so I guess I'm just curious if you can put in the chat, I'm wondering how many of you have had some type of training or information about a, uh, neurobiology of trauma or the trauma response. All right. Well, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm going to, I guess, take that as um, a uh, indication that either you haven't had much or little. Okay. Um, I see George raised his hand. Hang on. George, were you um, going to say anything? Right. Well, I'm going to take that as um some some to um know training on neurobiology of trauma. If you have had neurobiology of trauma training before, I do hope that um this can at least give you some more information or is a good refresher. If you haven't, I hope it's a great introduction. So before we dive into actually the neurobiology of trauma, I want to start on some of the basics. Um, so just be be. This is very basic, but I do think it's very important that we discuss these items before we dive into the neuro portion of things. So before we dive into the neuro, I want to discuss what trauma is. Um, and trauma is a normal emotional response to an extremely distressing event. Um, so what I really like to hone into on these on these um, definitions is that the words normal and the words extremely distressing event. So how somebody responds to trauma is a completely normal response, and it can range, um, the types of trauma symptoms you may see in somebody can range widely, um, and we'll go, go over some of those um, types of, I guess, symptoms of trauma after someone experiences something like sexual assault. But I also want to hone in on the, de the words extremely distressing event. Um, so if you have any thoughts on like the definition of an extremely distressing event, um, Feel, feel free to put that in the chat. But what I really like to note about this is that usually when I ask an audience what is an extremely distressing event, they start giving examples um, like war, rape, sexual assault, why we're here today. Those are all great examples of extremely distressing events. But we all kind of get to decide what is extremely distressing to us. So what be, might be extremely distressing to me may not be extremely distressing to you. So people can have a varying range of trauma responses, even if they experience the same event. Um, and that's why you see some, you know, examples of like soldiers that went off to war and they come home and some can adapt or cope with that um, trauma they saw and experienced over at uh, overseas or at war or on the front, whatever you want to say, um, differently than others. And it's because what is extremely distressing to one person may not be the same level of distressing to another. And we also all will demonstrate different uh, behaviors after a traumatic or extremely distressing event. So 
I kind of gave this away a little bit, but what are some events that can lead to trauma? Um, so there's a lot of examples that can lead to trauma and some types of events that can cause trauma reactions. And they can range from like community violence, war, um, natural disaster, abuse, car accidents, and sudden deaths of a loved one. Um, so but of course, why we're here today, sexual assault, sexual violence, and rape. Um, so again, this is just to highlight that there's a wide range of traumatic events somebody can experience that can lead to a trauma response and trauma behaviors. Um, and what's important to keep in mind when you're working with somebody who's experienced sexual assault is that sexual assault may not be the only trauma that they have experienced. So we all know about the state of sexual assault and rape in the military. So um, military war can overlap with um sexual assault and rape, you know, all of these things can happen and they're not happening in a vacuum. So you have to be aware of multitude or multiple possible traumatic events that somebody has experienced in their lifetime and how that can impact their reactions, their response to trauma, just keeping in mind that trauma can happen in a variety of different ways. So um, I want to highlight the DSM-5. So the DSM is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It is the manual used by psychiatrists to diagnose somebody with a um, psychiatric or mental illness. So before I dive into the definition of post-traumatic st stress disorder in accordance with the DSM, I do want to note that not every sexual assault survivor or anyone who experienced trauma will necessarily meet the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder or be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. That doesn't mean they didn't experience trauma. That doesn't mean they didn't have or aren't demonstrating trauma symptoms. It just indicates that they um, they may not meet the definition or the, the qualifying number of symptoms to require a diagnosis, but that doesn't mean, again, or discount what they experienced. So the reason, again, I highlight the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder as stated in the DSM is that it highlights it states direct or indirect exposure to traumatic event or repeated exposure to elements of traumatic events. There's two things I like, well, there's a number of things I like to note about this is the words direct and indirect. So this can be somebody that's directly experiencing the, and is a victim of sexual assault or a trauma, traumatic event can also be indirect exposure. So when we're working with individuals who have experienced trauma and who are telling us that trauma, it's very important to be aware of our own well-being because when we hear a lot of that over and over again, whether you're an attorney, an advocate, law enforcement conducting interviews when somebody reports sexual assault, um, they those elements, even though we're not directly experiencing, experiencing the trauma, those elements can lead to a trauma response. I also note repeated exposure because, of course, we see instances where somebody is repeated, uh, repeatedly abused or assaulted, whether that's because of an intimate partner relationship or they're the child of um, an abusive parent, whatever it may be. Um, so those all someone doesn't have to directly experience it to have trauma symptoms. Um, I also like to note that the definition further states that post-traumatic stress is something that develops when a person was exposed to death, threatened death, actual threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened sexual violence. And the thing, of course, because I'm highlighting a number of things of the definitions here today, but I like to note that the this can be even just threatened types of violence. Um, and I think that's very important to keep in mind when we're working with sexual assault survivors, intimate partner violence um, survivors, because we know that the power and control wheel, um, that threatened violence, threatened abuse, uh, threatened rape or sexual assault can be used as a means of controlling an individual, keeping them in a state of fear. So um, that is just something, again, to keep in mind is that just even if somebody didn't experience a sexual assault or rape on um, multiple occasions, but it's used regularly as a control mechanism, uh, it's something you want to be aware of. So how do you think somebody um, would respond to or how would they behave after experiencing a traumatic event? If you wanna put something in the chat, please do. I'm gonna take a sip of my water real quick. So um, 
appreciate any input. All right. Well, when somebody um, has experienced a traumatic event, they're typically viewed as going to be upset, crying, maybe hysterical or hyperventilating, however we want to describe somebody that is emotionally upset. Um, but it's important to recognize that when somebody is or has experienced a traumatic event, their behaviors and their responses can range very widely. So you can see somebody that may be crying in the immediate aftermath of an assault, um, or you may see somebody that's completely flat, have a flat affect when they're talking about what happened to them. They may show no emotional response to that, but they're just kind of flat, factual to the point. And that can seem a little odd. Sometimes you can even see somebody who's kind of happy, joking, laughing, making jokes about what happened to them. And that's also a way of coping um, and dealing with a traumatic event that happened to somebody. You can see all of these. It's a kind of like a spectrum and people's responses and um, behaviors after a traumatic event can range across that entire spectrum. Um, so one minute somebody could be happy and joking and the next time you meet with them, they're incredibly upset and crying a lot. Um, it's just because there's a range of emotions after somebody experiences trauma. And it's also really important to note um, that when somebody experiences a traumatic event and if somebody is interviewing that person in the aftermath of the event relatively soon after that happened, a lot of hormones and hormones are released into the body during a traumatic event and that can greatly impact how they behave and how they communicate when they're being an interviewed after a traumatic event that's in the immediate aftermath and that's also in the aftermath um, maybe weeks even months later when somebody's working with them or they're speaking about what happened to them So some of the main things to look for or be aware of when working with a survivor of sexual assault or rape are um, the re-experiencing of the event. So this is a trauma symptom that we often refer to, I think, kind of just colloquially, colloquial, we going to stop there. Um, just we often commonly refer to it as like flashbacks when somebody feels like they're back in the moment, something kind of reminds them of that and they start to like hyperventilate and they're almost experiencing the trauma again. Um, this can also take place in the form of nightmares and just in, intrusive or unwanted thoughts and memories about the event. There's also avoidance behaviors. So avoiding reminders of the trauma that they experienced, the assault. And sometimes that might make sense. And sometimes it might not make sense at all. So maybe somebody was assaulted after leaving a particular bar. Um, so they no longer want to go to that bar anymore. Or they're no longer going to fraternity parties because that's where they were assaulted. Um, and so they're avoiding those kind of environments. The other thing that I really like to note about college campuses is avoidance behaviors can kind of also look like um, absenteeism or not being productive. Those kinds of overlap with some of the other symptoms that we'll talk about here. But um, the one example that I always highlight when working with um, college students or people that work with college students is something as simple as somebody used to have really good attendance with their classes, they were really productive, they were early, and they were uh, participating in class. And then after the assault, they're actually late for class all the time. And it could be something as simple as they're taking a longer route to get to their class because normally they just went straight from one class to the other, they'd be passing the perpetrator because the nature of their schedules. So now they're taking a longer route to get to class and avoid that individual. So um, not making assumptions about somebody's absenteeism, tardiness, class performance is really important when working with uh, college students. <laughs> 
You'll also see, possibly see isolating behaviors. So no longer, again, I kind of noted it with re-experiencing or avoiding is no longer going to those parties or going out with friends, no longer enjoying the things that they used to do or engaging in activities. Maybe that's they were on a sports team or intramural sports with their friends, but they're instead isolating themselves and withdrawing. That's often a symptom of trauma. And negative thoughts or feelings. Um, so those kind of sad thoughts, depression, sometimes it may even come to like thoughts of self-harm or suicidal ideations, but negative thoughts or feelings um, that can overwhelm a trauma, uh, an individual after they've experienced trauma. Those are all kind of the key trauma symptoms that the DSM-5 highlights when looking at post-traumatic stress disorder. But again, um, somebody doesn't need to meet that definition of PTSD um, to be diagnosed with it. Um, they just, that does, if they don't, it doesn't mean they didn't experience the trauma and they could still have these types of um, responses and behaviors and symptoms of trauma. And I just want to note, I think I get into this in a couple slides, is that these don't have to start right away. It's not necessarily immediately after the trauma. Sometimes it can take some time before somebody starts demonstrating trauma symptoms. Um, and I'll actually talk about that in terms of data in a slide or two here. And actually, I think it's kind of this slide. So um, the couple things that I really want to note statistics, statistically about PTSD and sexual assault survivors is that when we're looking at the entire population of the United States, so that pie chart on your screen right now, the entire population of the United States, 7.8% of the U.S. will be diagnosed with PTSD at some point in their lifetime. So that's a pretty... I mean, that's a pretty small percentage of the United States, especially when we think about the different kinds of events that can lead to trauma symptoms. You know, again, war, car accidents, illness, sexual assault, community violence, only 7.8% will be diagnosed. But if you break that 7.8% down, 31% of those individuals have PTSD as the result of a sexual assault. So to me, when you're looking at that, that really demonstrates the impact sexual assault can have on someone's well-being and that traumatic experience. Again, um, there's a number of different things that we've talked about that can lead to trauma symptoms and PTSD. And so 31% of that 7.8% is a pretty significant number. So keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that of women that experience sexual assault, I don't have statistics on men. I haven't seen this the study recreated um, to address male survivors of sexual assault. We're keeping an eye out for it. Um, but uh, right now we only have the statistics on women. But like I said in the trauma symptoms slide is that someone may not demonstrate those trauma symptoms until weeks or months after an assault, maybe even never. Um, and that's demonstrated in the study that found that 94% of women who experience sexual assault um, showed symptoms two weeks after the assault. So um, that means that within the two weeks of the period of after the assault, 94% of those individuals started to show symptoms of trauma, but that's 6% that did not show any symptoms of trauma in those first two weeks. Again, it could take more months, years, or maybe they'll never show symptoms of trauma in the sense that we're typically looking out for. And it's all just based on the individual. So just because somebody's not showing those symptoms that you're looking out for, that you're familiar with, that you may expect to see from somebody who experienced sexual assault, doesn't mean that they didn't experience that assault. So I know I've asked for you guys to put a couple things in the chat a couple times. I really hope to get a little bit of feedback here on this question, but what do you guys think about um, false reports? How common or what percent of reports made, whether to police, to Title IX staff, to, I guess, mainly police in this situation or an authority type figure, what percentage would you say are false? 
Great. Michelle, thank you for um for her being the first to break the ice here. Um, so Michelle noted in the chat that um, I don't know per a percentage, but I know there can be motivations to lie. Does anyone else have any thoughts? All right, well, thank you, Michelle. Um, I do want to touch base uh, or touch on the false report statistics um, because sometimes when I do this training and it sometimes depends on the audience, we can see people say like over 50% of reports made of sexual assault and rape are false. We can see super low statistics like five, 3%, somewhere in the middle. Um, so I think it's really important when we have this narrative in our society about false reports. And I do think our society is, is kind of trending in the correct direction. Um, I really like to talk about where our knowledge on false reports of sexual assault comes from. So um, the, the bar graph on your screen, the bar on the left-hand side is demonstrates that over 40%, I think it's about 41% of rape accusations are false. That was a study and that number was, I believe, um, I believe it was um, discovered or it was obtained through a study conducted by a researcher known as Eugene Kanan in 1996. So that is kind of that foundation of this belief in our community and our society that about 50% of reports are false. But the bar on your right, uh, on the right hand side, is actually the accepted statistical and researched information on false reports that states about three to seven percent of reports made of sexual assault are actually false. So that's not a zero percent. There are false reports made, but three to seven percent is significantly lower than 50 percent. So I like to dive into how we got to a 50 percent um, number here. And that actually comes from the study conducted by Eugene Kanan. Again, it was 1996 and him and his team decided to look into this matter. And they went to a law enforcement agency in the United States. They told the agency what they were planning to do. They reviewed all the files of the uh, reports of sexual assault and rape that were made to that agency. And um, they then went to each of the victims and basically said, we're doing this study. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a polygraph test um, and see if you're lying or you're telling the truth. And if you're lying, um, you can be charged with false reporting um, and face consequences for that. So there was... <laughs> um, you can imagine, I'm sure, the, the problems here is that a lot of those individuals didn't want to take the polygraph. Even that statement alone suggests, like, we don't believe you. Um, also, the threat of being in trouble um, if they failed, um, even though polygraphs, you know, not admissible in court, etc. cetera. Um, so a lot of individuals said, oh, no, I'm not going to participate. Never mind. Forget it. Forget my report. Unfortunately, they these researchers counted that as a false report. Um, so these kind of really this kind of really skewed the numbers. They have a lot of people that didn't want to participate in the study, a lot of people that felt threatened. Um, and again, those individuals that said, I'm not participating, forget it, my report is false, they considered those false reports. They didn't actually look into the cases themselves. Further, this case, this case study or research study cannot be replicated. And that's an important part of research is that you can replicate the study and get very similar results. And it can't be replicated because Eugene Kanan never released a lot of information about the study. He never indicated what law enforcement agency he worked with. So no one knows if this was in an urban area, a rural area, a suburban area. Nobody knows the demographics we're looking at and those were never released. So the study could never be replicated. Instead, the accepted research and the more recent studies have demonstrated that false reports range from three to seven or eight percent. Um, and that is actually on on par with the amount of false reports for all the other crimes against a person that you that um, exist. So it's kind of lines up with, you know, mugging, physical assault, things like that. Um, false reports for sexual assault and rape are are on par with that and not unique in any way. And I think it's important for us 
and when we're working with sexual assault survivors to keep that in mind. Um, you know, the one thing I've learned through this work and the trainings that I've done with law enforcement and different um, agencies is that sometimes the craziest story you hear is the crazier the story, the more true it is. Um, so nothing should discount a, someone's story. You should take everything um, as true until proven otherwise when working with a survivor. Um, and just keep in mind that the statistics are very, very low when it comes to the number of false reports people make about sexual assault and rape. So when someone is sexually assaulted, they may behave in ways that people find difficult to understand. Like I said, they may not be crying or upset. They may appear normal um, on the outside. So though those behavior, these behaviors often lead to victim blaming attitudes from those around them and often leave survivors themselves asking why. Why didn't I do X, Y, and Z when I was being assaulted? Um, and in fact, all these behaviors that somebody may demonstrate are normal. Um, they're normal neurobiological responses to trauma. And um, trauma affects many different regions of the brain. And we're going to discuss a few today. Um, and before we get started on that, I want to share a brief video. I don't know if anyone has seen it before, but I think it's, if anyone ever tells you, talk to me about the trauma, neurobiology of trauma, um, in 10 minutes or less, show them this video. It is a excellent video that demonstrates the neurobiology of trauma. Um, please keep in mind, it is a Scottish video, so the accent is a little heavy. I will put on the closed captions for you, but even with that, sometimes the closed captions get it wrong because of the heavy accent. Um, this video, again, is an excellent overview of trauma in the brain, and once we wrap that up, I'm going to... Um, I will uh, dig into the what is mentioned in the video a bit more. And I think I may have forgotten to turn on the sound for sharing video, so I'm just going to quickly stop share and reshare. Can you guys hear that? We need to take a statement so we can establish what happened on Saturday night. What time did you get back to David's flat? What time? I don't know. Can you give us an estimate? I don't remember. Would your pals remember what time you left the club? He seemed nice. <laughs> She didn't remember much, did she? I know. And now we've got to waste more time on a daft lecture. We know how to deal with victims. We've had years of experience. Well, some of us have had more years than others. I'm in my prime, I'll have you know. That'll be right. Today's session is about trauma. The latest in brain science will help you in your work. I'll start with a tour of the parts of the human brain. The reptilian brain maintains basic bodily functions. The limbic system is also instinctive. It deals with fear and pleasure. For example, you pat a dog, it senses pleasure, and without thinking, wags its tail. The neocortex is the site of logic, imagination, planning, and control. It's more sophisticated, but because it's conscious, it's slower than the older parts of the brain. The amygdala is a key part of the limbic system. It has one job, to sense danger and set off the alarm. When it's a matter of survival, the primitive parts of the brain override the conscious part. There are three possible survival responses. Fight, flight, or the one that people don't think of, freeze. When the alarm goes off, Blood and oxygen are diverted to muscles, adrenaline floods the body, and all systems that are not crucial to survival are switched off. Normally, the job of the hippocampus is to file memories so you can retrieve them later, but in times of danger, it stops filing memories, which makes it harder to gather evidence later on. Instead, the hippocampus switches to pumping cortisol, 
What's useful about cortisol is it stops us feeling pain, so we can focus on survival. Can anyone give me an example? A farming accident where a man carried his own arm for a mile without feeling any pain? Yes, excellent example. It is an evolutionary safety mechanism which is fast and instinctive. In essence, it's our body's very clever way of protecting us. To recap, an example of the three parts of the brain working together. You're standing at a bar. Your reptilian brain is keeping your heart beating. You're enjoying the pleasure of a nice pint with your limbic system. You're using your neocortex to work out if there's time for another before the last train. What could happen to make the amygdala kick in? What if this happened? The way you'd respond would depend not on your logical brain, but on your instinctive brain. Being glassed in a bar would be a traumatic experience. Who can give me another example of an event that can cause trauma? War? Rape? A car crash? Good, yes. Trauma occurs when a person is overwhelmed by something beyond their control. The survival brain takes over the rational brain. It can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, with symptoms that last at least a month. Vicarious, or secondary trauma, is something you may experience if you deal with incidents such as rape, or sudden death, or think of Lockerbie, Dumblain. You're not superheroes. Having a brain makes you all vulnerable to secondary trauma. It's important to understand that when trauma occurs again and again, it can become complex PTSD, such as in domestic abuse or child sexual abuse. The alarm system in the brain becomes jammed. Memories are stuck in the limbic system, so a trigger can set off the alarm. The trigger could be anything, a color, a smell, a sound, a sensation. Now, the indicators of trauma. What should you be looking out for? Depression. Crying a lot? Yes, that's one response. And at the other end of the spectrum, total numbness. Nightmares. Flashbacks. Stress. Good, yes. And they may feel sick. Also, shame, feelings of guilt, inability to enjoy sex, social isolation, triggers. People often feel overwhelmed by the symptoms of trauma. This can lead to using alcohol or other drugs to block out memories, or self-harm, or dissociation when a person's mind detaches from reality. Indicators can be specific to the type of trauma. Say, dental problems, when someone who was orally abused avoids going to the dentist. A victim of abuse might bond strongly to her abuser. This is known as traumatic bonding, or Stockholm Syndrome. And jumbled up memory, when a person's normal recording of memories doesn't work. Can you recall any times you've seen that symptom? What time? I don't know. A traumatised person may not seem like her usual self, or may be hypervigilant, on edge, or being startled by everyday things. Everyone is different. You never know what impact trauma will have. Symptoms can change from day to day. So what does all this mean in practice, in your job? A traumatized person's brain is protecting them, but that normal human response of self-protection can get in the way of evidence gathering. The US military has developed new trauma-informed interviewing techniques that you can use to work around this. Research shows that if someone seems vacant, they could be distracted by their traumatic memories. Try to ground them by asking a simple, non-patronizing question such as, are you thirsty? Do you want a glass of water? This can help bring them back to the here and now. Don't expect a logical, linear story. Ask, what can you recall just now? Find out what the victim physically felt or saw. Working this way, from the instinctive sensory parts towards the logical parts of the brain, you'll get more results. In conclusion, four things for you to take away. Trauma response is the brain in survival mode. Repeated abuse can make trauma symptoms worse. In response to trauma, people will behave in unexpected ways. Remember, trauma is a normal human response 
to abnormal events. We know that you've gone through a really painful experience, but we need to take a statement to understand what happened on Saturday night. Are you able to tell us anything that you remember about his flat? Anything at all? A dog barking. Are you able to remember any physical sensations or feelings that you had? Cigarette smoke. I can smell it now. What was going through your mind? I couldn't understand it. I just couldn't move or even scream. To freeze is a perfectly normal response. So you start with the memories you don't start at the beginning. You have to engage with feelings to get to the facts. Makes sense. Check you, Professor, getting all sciencey on us. Well, if it gets us usable evidence. There's life in the old dog yet. Oi. So, like I said, I think that video is an excellent kind of high-level overview of trauma and the neurobiology of trauma and how it impacts somebody maybe recalling events or how they may behave. So I want to really take some time then as we move on into kind of digging into the things that were mentioned that may that are happening in the brain when somebody experiences trauma. But before I do that, I want to highlight um, two things that were, well, one thing that was mentioned in the video, and that is the military training that the United States developed or the interviewing technique that the US, um, the military developed. And that is actually a interviewing technique known as FETI, um, which stands for Forensic Experiential Trauma Interviewing. Um, and this type of interviewing technique really hones in on trying to incorporate the neurobiology of trauma into how a victim of trauma has um, is interviewed and what questions they're asked. So it was developed by Russell Strand, who was um, with the U.S. military police. I believe he's retired now. Um, but some the key elements uh, of this type of interviewing technique is to uh, express genuine em empathy with the victim survivor. So when we're talking to law enforcement about this interviewing technique, the first thing that Fetty tells law enforcement to do is actually to acknowledge um, what the person experienced or apologize for it. So something along the lines of, I'm sorry that you experienced this um, and that we're meeting this way, but I do, I'm here to help you and I have a few questions for you to help me understand what happened. Um, so kind of that acknowledgement of the pain, trauma they experienced and oftentimes law enforcement is a little hesitant to do this because they feel like that's stating that they believe somebody when their job is actually to remain neutral and find out what happened. Um, but Russell Strand argues that starting off a conversation with a survivor with that genuine empathy does not negate somebody's role as a neutral investigator. In fact, it sets them up to better be a neutral investigator because it creates a positive rapport with the survivor. That means interviewing. Um, may be easier, the survivor will feel more comfortable and trusting of them um, after that initial kind of statement that is made, and therefore it helps them be a better neutral investigator. So something to keep in mind when you're first working with a survivor is kind of acknowledging what they experienced and that it's difficult for them. Um, a couple other techniques are to make sure you're not asking for a linear chronological recount of what they experienced. Um, and also kind of asking them to expand on their answers by leaving open, un, open ended questions like help me understand, or can you tell me more about, um, and we'll get into some of the reasons that that is, uh, that type of questioning is used and how it's tied into neurobiology of trauma. Um, and of course, listening to the survivor and not interrupting them as they're telling their story, writing down as much as you can, and then you can circle back once they've completed telling you um, what they experienced and ask some questions. Um, it's further noted that you should, uh, in Fetty, you're looking at the sensations somebody had experienced, like color, sound, smell, sensation, physical sensations, pleasure and pain are more important or are going to be more apparent to the survivor than a chronological narrative. So again, not expecting that chronological narrative and just taking the information that the person has to offer you and trying to build from it, worrying about putting it in a linear timeline um, at a later time. 
I also like to highlight because um, when somebody experiences sexual assault, they should be offered, it's kind of best practice to make sure they're <clears throat> given access to forensic medical exam or a sexual assault forensic exam known as a SAFE. They should be offered an advocate, um, safe spaces um, to, to be present in. And one other thing that is recommended based on neurobiology of trauma is to allow them one sleep cycle, one or two sleep cycles before doing a full intensive interview with them. And so I highlight the officer involved shooting guidelines that are presented by the International Association Chiefs of Police. Um, this is mainly a point that I like to use when working with law enforcement, because I think it really helps capture what we're trying to do when we offer um, an advocate and focus on forensic medical care first, because law enforcement is so naturally engaged of, I need to know what happened. I need to capture or like apprehend this perpetrator. I need to find them. Um, and actually when responding that way, it can hinder and um, create more difficulties with somebody recalling information. So I really highlight that the International Association of Chiefs of Police um, recommends that when an officer is involved in a civilian shooting, that there are certain steps an agency should take and their policy, policy should note that the officer involved in the shooting should be transported to a safe and um, supportive environment immediately. They should be offered a privileged communication. So they should be offered either an advocate, um, a peer, or even an attorney or union representative to speak to before they start going through um, the interview of what happened to them. So that's just like the same as an advocate for a sexual assault survivor. And then um, they would normally do like some initial information at the scene and, you know, take the gun and the badge um, and handle everything. But before they give a in-depth, detailed interview, they're supposed to be given at least one sleep cycle um, to help with kind of that memory recall after a traumatic event and allowing the body to kind of come back down to a normal state. And I really highlight this because sometimes it is kind of against natural instinct to give a survivor of sexual assault that space, that advocacy support, and that time to sleep before getting into the details of things. But if we, if our International Association of Chiefs of Police recognizes this within its own uh, officers, and when they're involved in something traumatic related to work, then we should also be applying the same thing to victims of crime. So now we're going to get into the fun part, at least in my opinion, and the, the actual neurobiology of trauma. So I'm going to try and relate some of this all back to the video and things you saw there. And we're going to start off with the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So in the video, um, they refer to the prefrontal cortex as the neocortex. It's that front part of your brain that's responsible for executive functioning, that really critical planning um, thought process that we all have. So for example, you know, I knew I had this training at like 10, 10, 15 today. So um, I had to plan the night before I had to think out, okay, what time do I need to get up so I can be dressed? I can um, review the slides in advance, have time for a cup of coffee and something to eat. That's really my prefrontal cortex kicking into play to plan for the next day. Um, it is pretty much, you know, what separates us from a lot of other animals in the animal kingdom. Um, and then you also have the amygdala, which was what the video kind of demonstrated as that alarm bell. It is the, um, it's in the center core of the brain and it is constantly active and scanning your environment for potential threats. So it's ideally right now you're in a state where it's kind of normal and your amygdala is pretty quiet. You may be like, aware of if a door slams in the uh, room next door to you or if somebody walks by your window, you know, it's kind of almost your amygdala checking like, okay, what is that? What's, what's, is there a threat to my well being? Um, and, but ideally it's relative, relatively quiet right now. And similarly, ideally your prefrontal cortex is very active. You know, you're paying attention to this presentation, you're trying to do some critical thinking of how can I apply this to the survivors I work with, or have I seen anything like this in the future? So your prefrontal cortex is really thinking things through and taking notes and listening to the presentation. That's your ideal state. Unfortunately, when trauma happens or there is a threat to an individual, everything flips. The amygdala, that alarm bell, starts sounding and it gets really active and loud, so to speak, and it's preventing the prefrontal cortex from operating in an ideal manner. So again, um, 
the, the scenario and our optimal functioning is amygdala is pretty quiet, but aware of your surroundings. Prefrontal cortex is active, allows you to plan the rest of your day, a plan your goals, things throughout life that you want to achieve. But when that trauma happens, when there's a threat to someone's well-being, there's that flip. Um, and the amygdala prevents the prefrontal cortex from operating, operating in an ideal manner. When that amygdala sounds and is you know, alerting the, the brain and the body that there's a threat um, to the individual, it actually kicks in the HPA axis, um, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal gland. The HPA axis is um, kind of the, the glands in the body responsible for releasing hormones um, throughout, you know, just your standard day. Um, the hypothalamus is like the center of the brain that is kind of, it's often referred to as a grand central station of the brain. Its primary purpose is to communicate with all the other structures in the brain and the body about me, what needs to happen. So something as simple as like me moving my hands while I'm talking, all of those messages are traveling from the prefrontal cortex to the parts of the brain and body that need to function so that I, I move. And apparently now I'm very aware of all these hand gestures I'm making. Um, but that's all channeling through um, the hypothalamus. So when that alarm bell sounds, the hypothalamus is saying, hey, you know, there's potential danger and it's communicating with our pituitary gland, which is considered the master gland of our, um, of our bodies. And it is responsible for communicating to all the other glands throughout the body about the release of hormones um, into, into the body. So in the instance of the traumatic event, the, the pituitary gland is communicating with the adrenal gland that there's something that's a threat to us or something traumatic is happening to our body. And we need to release this set of hormones that is gonna help us increase our chance of survival. Um, so the adrenal glands then release this flood of hormones that is meant to, um, like I said, increase our chances of survival, but it can have some negative impacts on our brain functioning, like memory processing and storage. So when that adrenal or that uh, um, adrenal gland releases this hormones, I refer to it as um, a cocktail of hormones because it's not just one hormone there are many hormones released and again they're flooded they're usually like an abnormally high level of these hormones um I'm gonna highlight a couple here first i'll start with catecholamines catecholamines you know that's that's going to capture like adrenaline which can help somebody with that um fight or flight response um, and give their body the energy it would need to respond in one of those ways you also have cortisol being released and cortisol is just largely considered the stress hormone. Um, it also affects energy levels. And if it's released in the body, it's going to help that adrenaline to possibly give a fight or flight response. Then you also have opiates. Um, these are naturally occurring opiates in the body. This is not like heroin being released. I have had to clarify it before, but these naturally occurring opiates help blunt the physical pain. Um, so in the video, they talk about, you know, a farmer carrying his own arm after an accident um, without feeling any pain. That's the naturally occurring opiates blunting the pain so that he could do what he needed to do to get help and the care he needed. And then you also have oxytocin being released. This is a little bit of a controversial um, hormone that people, when we talk about traumatic uh, traumatic events, why would why would oxytocin be released in the body? Um, if you have any ideas, there's there's oxytocin is not released in the body in many instances. It's it's pretty few and far between. So why would it happen in a traumatic event? If you have any thoughts on that, I mean, I'm gonna dive into it, but feel free to put them in the chat. But oxytocin naturally occurs in the body when we're engaging with pets or animals. So it's one of the reasons why they say it's very healthy and mentally um, beneficial and emotionally beneficial to somebody to have a pet, a cat, a dog, bird, whatever it may be. Um, because when you engage with them, your body naturally releases, releases oxytocin. Your body also naturally releases oxytocin when in labor and breastfeeding. And that's meant to help create a bond with the child while breastfeeding or while in physical labor. I mean, think about it. Women can be in labor for 
days. My mom says I was upside down with the cord around my neck and I was just a pain for her. Um, but oxytocin and that release while she was giving birth to me helped create that bond. Um, and there's actually studies trying to look into if lower levels of oxytocin released during labor are correlated with um, postpartum depression, depression, but that's another um, topic. Oxytocin is also released when you're having consensual sex with a partner because you're supposed to bond with that individual. Um, so why would oxytocin be released during a traumatic event like rape or sexual assault? And the way to look at it is it's the emotional version of opiates. It is helping blunt the um, emotional pain and the horror of what somebody is experiencing it. So it's blunting that and preventing them from processing that, you know, that horrific experience they're having. Um, there is some questions. It's kind of hard to look into it um, ethically, but there are some questions on whether or not the amount of oxytocin somebody releases during a traumatic event is correlated with actually um, Stockholm syndrome and that re positive relation some, or attachment somebody may have with their abuser. So that's the purpose of oxytocin being released during a traumatic event. When all of these hormones are released, it shuts down the prefrontal cortex. So again, so if you remember, as soon as that alarm bell sounds, the prefrontal cortex starts shutting down and that executive functioning and thinking can't happen. And then once the hormones are released, it is continued to be shut down. So it can't really recover. These hormones are preventing it from kicking back in. This is why when we experience trauma, we need to rely on learned behavior. This is not me saying that people should be trained on how to respond if they're sexually assaulted or involved in some type of accident. Um, but this is saying that, you know, every single one of us has this trauma response in the body. It is natural. It is nurring, normal. It is evolutionary. And it's important to remember that it's every single one of us will experience it. This is why if you want to override that trauma response, you need learned behavior. And this is why our military, our first responders, firefighters, EMS, police go through rigorous training over, you know, if, if this scenario happens, this is what you do. Because the intent is that they've trained and they've practiced it so much that when they're in that situation in the real world, those behaviors kick in without a second thought and they override this trauma response. But even that is not a guarantee. We all hear circumstances where police freeze, um, military members go AWOL, whatever it may be, because the trauma response is still going to occur, regardless of how hard you train, how many behaviors you try to adapt. It is still going to occur. So there's no real guarantee way to override it. It's always going to happen. So now I want to talk about how all of this happening in the body, the amygdala sounding and the stress hormones flooding the, um, the body affect memory and memory recall. So I did not realize these were all individual clicks, but essentially um, the hippocampus is the part of the brain that is responsible for, you know, processing and storing memories. I think in the video, it like kind of I like the imagery it gives of like a filing cabinet. Um, and that process of the filing of information is disrupted when fear or trauma kick in. So what I try and kind of think about is my, I think of my memory as like a series of filing cabinets. So if somebody asked me what I had for breakfast today, I would go to Monday, November 6th, I think it is. I would look at, you know, meals, breakfast, and pull out a folder that should tell me what I ate today. That is the ideal processing of a memory. Everything's stored in the correct folder. When trauma kicks in and the hormones um, are flooding the body, those that storage process gets all disrupted. The memories are being formed. They're just not being stored necessarily in the correct place. So they're harder to recall. Um, so somebody may go to the typical filing cabinet to pull out what they had for breakfast. And when they open the folder, it's not there. That's because, again, the memories are just kind of disrupted and stored in a manner that is not normal for the human brain. Doesn't mean they're not accurate. It just means they might be difficult to ret retrieve. Um, and I also want to note while talking about this, uh, something referred to as super encoding versus minimal encoding. Um, this is something trauma survivors experience when something is 
very much ingrained. It is an easy memory for them to recall. It is ingrained in their brain and they have that information readily available. That is super encoding. Mem minimal encoding is when somebody has trouble remembering something because it wasn't encoded as significantly as the other information. That doesn't mean, um, again, that that minimal encoded memory isn't accurate. It just means that it wasn't um, encoded as, as significantly. And usually what happens is that the brain super encodes things that happened before and after a traumatic event. And what the brain is actually trying to do is it's trying to say, hey, we need to remember this because if we see it again, if we experience this again, it should indicate to us that we're in danger. Um, so it should be a signal in the future. So it's, it's um, encoding those end pieces, so to speak, in a super encoding manner. And then what happens in the middle, that actual traumatic sexual assault or rape is minimally encoded because the brain doesn't need to remember that happening, but it needs to necessarily remember what's going to keep us safe in the future. That's often what you see with super encoding and minimal encoding. I also really want to highlight that alcohol can worsen encoding. So you have trauma. And then if you have somebody who is drinking, whether voluntarily or not, um, that can, and can make memory recall even more difficult. It doesn't prohibit it. It doesn't mean their memories are completely gone, but alcohol can make it worse. If you add in uh, drug facilitated, the drugs that are usually used with drug facilitated sexual assault, oftentimes if somebody has that complete lapse in memory, because of the drug, those memories are gone and it's um, not possible for them to recall them. So just keep in mind, especially when working with um, students, is that alcohol doesn't mean that their memories are inaccurate or not um, retrievable. And you might be wondering why this picture on the screen is just post-it notes in a kind of disorderly fashion. I really like to kind of give this example. It's an example Rebecca Campbell gives. Um, she's a neurobio neuro bio biological researcher uh, from Michigan, I think. And she always gives the example to try and help people really capture what this feels like, is that if you had to sit through this presentation today and take notes on post-it notes, you know, your, your supervisor came in and gave you a bunch of different post-it notes, different colors, different sizes, different pens, and you had to take notes on those. All of our notes are going to look different. You know, somebody's note may be very simple and it said, it might say hippocampus equals memory. And then somebody else's note may be word for word everything I just described to you from the hippocampus. Either way, you have end up with a bunch of post-it notes that describe this presentation. And your supervisor says to you, okay, I want you to go to your desk and I want you to hide them all over the place. I want you to crumple them up, put them in your pen drawer, put them under your laptop, put them in the drawers of your desk and walk away for 24 hours. And then the next day they come to you and say, I want you to get every single post-it note and put them in chronological order and give me the presentation back to me. That is what you're asking a survivor to do when you're asking them to recount what happened to them. The post-it notes are there and you know they're there. You know you took the notes. They're there. It just might take you a while to remember, oh, that one's in my pen drawer. Oh, that one's in underneath all my printer paper. Whatever it may be, it may take you a while to put all the pieces together and put them in chronological order. So um, that's kind of the comparison of what you're asking somebody to do when you're asking them to retell their their what happened to them. Similarly, I also like to um, refer to try and capture what somebody who experienced trauma who's trying to recall something may experience. It's not the same. So please don't take it as me saying that this is the same thing. But the best way to kind of try and understand what they're dealing with, aside from the post-it note examples, is the tip of the tongue sensation. Somebody may have that memory and they just can't, they just can't grasp it. We've all been there. We've all been in that scenario where we're like, I know I know this word, but I can't remember this word. It's on the tip of my tongue. And so some of these individuals are going to, those memories are going to be there and they may struggle and become frustrated when they can't recall them because they know the information is there and they um, just can't recall it. And there are ways for us to help them um, recall that information. And that's oftentimes by asking questions like, can you tell me a little bit more about how that felt? Can you tell me how your body responded when X, Y, and Z happened? Um, can you tell me more about um, 
the room. You said there was blue curtains. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you saw? This is allowing them an open-ended question to build on it. And sometimes that is all it takes for them to be like, oh yeah. And the walls were, were, were painted red. And I know I was in the second floor of this fraternity house. Okay. That's, that's great information for us. So there's ways for you to help them with that tip of the tongue sensation. So now we're going to get into how the body will physically, um, the behaviors of the body outside of the brain. How does this affect how our body physically responds traumatic event, to a traumatic event? And this is something that we is often referred to as the defense cascade. So what you see on your screen is the different um, elements of defense that somebody may demonstrate experience when experiencing trauma. So um, the important thing to note here is that you can move through this defense cascade in a random order. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily, oh, you start with this and you go through to collapsed immobility. Um, it can be a variety. It doesn't have to include every single one of these responses, um, but this is the um, different defense um, mechanisms that somebody may demonstrate. And we start with what's left, what's on the um, left-hand side of orientation, social engagement, tend and be friend. So this is actually what I often just refer to as self-protection habits. Um, they're polite responses to unwanted behave, sexual behavior. So how many of us have been taught of like, oh, I always think of office space, the movie office space where the they're always asking somebody for the stapler, the red stapler. So, you know, these are behaviors where, you know, your, your coworker is constantly taking your stapler from your desk and not putting it back going to start to annoy you. And it may be like, you, oh, I've asked you a million times to put it back. Why can't you get your own stapler? You're not hopefully going to like snap and yell at your coworker because that's just not appropriate. You have that planned kind of response that's just polite, but also kind of trying to say, hey, can you stop doing that? That's exactly what this is when somebody may be approached by somebody else um, who ends up being sexually assaulting them. So this may be somebody saying something like, my partner will be bad, mad. I have an early day tomorrow and I have a test. I can't go home with you. Um, I don't have any condoms and I'm not going to you know, have sex with you without protection. Or I'm sorry, my friends are looking for me. I need to go find them. These are all those polite self-protection habits we have ingrained to kind of say no thank you without being rude or um, aggressive. So ideally, when somebody uses these kinds of phrases, then that is the end of it. The rejection is noted and everyone moves in their own direction and that's the end of it. But what happens when the self-protection habits don't work? And that's when fight, flight, or freeze comes into play. So when a counter, encountering a threat like a sexual assault or rape, the body responds with either fight, flight, or freeze. And actually the body, no matter what, before fight, flight, or freeze happens, an initial freeze response is first. And oftentimes people describe that as like, oh, a deer in headlights. And yeah, it's a decent example, but also that deer is just kind of blinded and not sure what to do. So I prefer to talk about a bunny rabbit. So you're walking through the park, you come across a bunny who darts out from underneath a bush. What often happens is that bunny freezes and it may not even be looking at you, but oftentimes you can see its nose and whiskers twitching and its ears kind of turning. That's that initial freeze response. It is assessing whether or not you're a threat and what response it should engage in. So sometimes the rabbit may just stand there and let you walk by and then it goes back to whatever it's doing. Sometimes it may just run back under the bush it came from or another bush um, and it's fleeing. Never really seen a rabbit fight when I've crossed one in a park, but that is another potential response. So that initial freeze helps the brain determine what the best course of action is for this rabbit's um, survival. So that can be fighting, flinging, or a continued freeze response. And when we talk about a continued freeze response, there are actually two types of that. The first one is tonic immobility. So tonic immobility is when you actually often hear survivors say, like in the video we watched, um, I don't know what happened. I just couldn't move. I couldn't, um, I felt frozen. I was paralyzed. These, that's a set, an indicator of tonic immobility. It's an uncontrolled paralysis in response to intense fear. 
it often starts um at the initial like at a touch um it kind of like can i don't want to like that initial touch that indicates intense fear can kind of cause somebody to freeze up and tense up um so not just like a touch on the arm but maybe that initial bit of penetration somebody experiences when being assaulted can cause that freezing up um and actually 70 percent of sexual assault survivors uh, reported experiencing tonic immobility during a sexual assault a couple things to keep in mind is tonic immobility has a very quick onset and a very quick return to what all refers to homeostasis. So I don't want to say like the body is completely in a state of calm and normalcy, but coming out of that um, tonic immobility is very quick. It's like flipping on a light switch on and off. A couple things to keep in mind is when somebody's experiencing tonic immobility, their muscles are very tense. So um, they are like uh, almost flexing their muscles, they're tense. The heart rate increases, the respiratory rate increases. So while they're frozen, everything is increasing because of that stress that they're experiencing. That's tonic immobility. In contrast, we also have collapsed immobility. This is actually when a survivor may say they felt like a rag doll or they went limp. Um, this is when they actually lose that muscle tone. So it's the opposite of tonic immobility. It's the loss of muscle tone. Um, and sometimes there's loss of consciousness as well. It's not required to have been, you know, experienced collapsed in mobility, but it is possible. Um, and the onset and return to homeostasis is very slow. So it takes somebody a lot longer to get that mobility back. Um, and also it is the opposite of tonic immobility in the sense that everything drops. The respiratory rate drops. The muscle tension is gone. The heart rate drops. Everything kind of comes to a slower pace during collapse and mobility. And, you know, the way that a lot of people talk about it is uh, playing dead. You know, a possum plays dead as a defense mechanism. So I really, um, when I was first learning about neurobiology of trauma, I was always like, why is that a trauma response? Like, isn't playing dead actually you know, just making it easier for an offender. And what I learned is that, you know, when we look at the animal kingdom, when we look at this, the the foundations of this evolutionarily response is that playing dead is actually beneficial to, uh, for a prey because in you know, caveman times and in our animal kingdom, when a predator comes across a dead prey, that is something that they consider potentially dangerous to them. They do not want to consume this meat because it could make them ill. Like how many of us every time Chipotle was like, oh, we have this issue with our beef, our chicken, our lettuce. We all stopped eating Chipotle. Eventually we kind of probably went back to it and then stopped again when it happened again. But it was like a, a response for us of like, hey, I'm not gonna eat something that makes me sick. And so that's kind of like something looking back at where this kind of comes from. So um, the video that I have was going to show is not up. If we have time at the end, I will see if I can pull it up. It looks like the URL is, may no longer be valid, um, but uh, we can send that link out after the training as well. I will note it is of the ant uh, is of an impala, and I believe a cheetah. Um, but I think it's very helpful in looking at collapse and mobility. It's, I know it's animals, nobody gets hurt. There's no blood, there's no gore, but it demonstrates the impala responding in this collapsed immobility um, when it is being threatened by, I think it's a cheetah. And um, you'll note if you watch the video and, and take time with it, you can't actually tell that the impala is breathing. You can't tell anymore. Um, the cheetah bites its neck and it kind of just flops to the side because it doesn't have any muscle tone. It's not blinking. Um, and then when the cheetah lets it be, um, the impala slowly starts to increase its breathing rate, its respiratory rate, and it slowly starts to gain muscle control and regain, um, you know, standing and it's, uh, ends up taking off. So it's a really good example of, you know, collapsed immobility and what that can look like, um, in real life. So I'll see if I can locate that at the end. So the other thing I want to go through is just some other examples aside from Impala of these tonic and collapsed immobility responses in the animal kingdom. Um, and I promise there's a bit more to this than just some amusing um, 
an amusement break here in the presentation. But some examples of uh, animals that demonstrate tonic, tonic immobility in nature are sharks. Um, I find that one fascinating because they're considered, you know, one of the biggest uh, predators in the animal kingdom. But uh, somebody, I guess, discovered whoever it was decided to dive down and rub a chart shark under its chin. And if you do that, it'll go into tonic immobility and float nose down um, and straight up because it's kind of it's kind of frozen. Um, so sharks, chickens, if you've ever seen a chicken scared, it'll like have its legs straight out. Everything is stiff and tonic immobility. Similarly, fainting goats, if you share, if you scare a fainting goat, it does that. Um, it is very stiff um, and experiencing tonic immobility. We also have collapsed immobility. Um, hognose snakes uh, actually experience collapsed immobility as a response to threats. And then actually they release an odor of death to further deter a predator. Possums as well. This is one of my favorite Geico commercials, I think. Um, couldn't play the full thing because I didn't want to suggest that we necessarily are endorsed by Geico or we endorse them, but it's, a, it's an amusing commercial in my opinion. So possums play dead, um, impalas, and then human beings. Um, if you ever have, you need a break from your work, Google slingshot videos. Um, they're incredibly amusing of individuals on these rides where they completely can go in and out of consciousness and go limp. Um, and, you know, while some may argue that that's G forces or whatever, it can also be a fear response. And I just also find those videos very amusing, but obviously humans experience these responses as well. So what's the point of me going over that and showing those GIFs? Um, it's because not only is it important for us to recognize as those working with survivors that these responses are normal and that we need to help convey them when working with a survivor, presenting a case, whatever it may be. Survivors often wonder why they responded the way they did as well. And if we can explain to them that it wasn't a choice, they didn't do anything wrong because they froze or because they went limp. It's evolutionarily ingrained in us to respond in those manners. It's not a choice in the moment. And if we can explain that to them and indicate that this happens throughout the animal kingdom and it's it's normal, it may help them just um, understand that there's no blame in the way they responded. Um, and they may feel better about understanding why they, they responded the way that they did. And we so we have the different, we have fight, flight, freeze, and the two types of freeze, tonic and collapsed immobility. You also have dissociation as a potential um trauma response. This is when somebody may feel like they're outside their body. You know, it could be like they say they're watching themselves from above. They're watching what happened to them from above. They feel blank, disconnected, um, and they may even enter autopilot. So there may be scenarios where, you know, somebody is instructed what to do by a perpetrator and they do everything that they're told. Um, and somebody may be like, why did you do that? Why did you do what he told you to do? Why did you take off your clothes? Um, there was a case, I think, in Washington County years ago where somebody was assaulted and they instructed her to take off her clothes. They instructed her what sex acts to engage in. And then afterwards, they instructed her to take a bath in bleach. And a lot of people were like, why would you do that? Like, you you should know better. Um, and that's that autopilot. Sometimes it's self preserving to do as you're told mentally, physically, it's, it is deemed the safer option to just do as you're told and kind of move through the motions to go back to the case example. I gave the just little less depressing for a Monday morning, the nurse, even though the, the survivor bathed in bleach, the nurse still took swabs where indicated and they were still able to obtain his DNA. And he was, um, uh, incarcerated. I don't know if he still is, but um, just to make sure we're not um, starting the day off with such a depressing case. Um, but yeah, you might see that autopilot, somebody moving through the motions as a form of self-protection. Um, you also may see some dissociation when talking to a survivor, working with them on their case and talking about what happened to them. They may start to seem vacant um, or they may even indicate that they're feeling like they're outside of their body. That is a, a, a defense mechanism, dissociation. Um, and the video on trauma in the brain did go over how some techniques for grounding. Um, so, you know, offering somebody if they want a glass of water, as soon as you say to somebody, are you thirsty? 
naturally our body kind of does an assessment of our body in the moment. Am I thirsty? I'm incredibly thirsty right now. Um, so I'm kind of assessing that like, okay, yeah, I'm thirsty. I need water. It helps somebody focus on the here and now versus those memories or feeling outside their body. It helps them bring them back in. So grounding techniques are excellent to be used when you have somebody who's experiencing dissociation. So I'm going to show a short video on the defense cascade in action. Again, this is an animal video. I promise no animals get hurt in this video. Um, I'm going to turn the sound off because it's just music and it's incredibly loud. So um, I will just um, keep the sound off for this. Um, I want you to just kind of keep an eye on the mouse um, and his response during this engagement with the cat. So if you notice at the beginning of this, um, the mouse is very much like limp. The um, cat is able to push it around. It's almost like we could assume collapsed immobility. At some point it starts to regain its mobility. You can see its respiration rate start to kick in. Um, its nose twitching, its lungs kind of moving quickly for air. Um, and then it slowly starts to gain um, you know, mobility back and decides to fight the cat for whatever reason. Um, so I think this is an important video to demonstrate that the defense cascade is a cascade. Somebody can move through their responses during one traumatic event. It is not necessarily like, oh, this person experiences tonic immobility and that's all they're going to experience during the traumatic event. No, they can move through that defense cascade and have multiple response during one traumatic event. Also, if somebody has multiple, um, experiences multiple traumatic events, um, you know, they're in an intimate partner relationship that has some abuse in it. Um, just because they experience tonic immobility the first time doesn't mean they're always going to experience tonic immobility. The defense cascade, um, they can respond in any manner um, during those traumatic events and during those events abusive instances. So it's not one and done or guaranteed a certain type of response for an individual. So what are the consequences of the neurobiology of trauma and possibly like the um, immobility, tonic or, or collapsed um, or choosing, you know, how somebody responds to trauma? What are the consequences? So the consequences are kind of, I think, um, easy to understand. Survivors may start to doubt themselves, um, engage in self-blame. They might be less likely to report because they might think like, oh, I, I didn't fight back. I didn't move. I didn't call for help. Um, so maybe, you know, they're going to blame me. They're going to say it was my fault. Or maybe I did want it because I didn't do anything to stop it. A lot of survivors experience that blame and self-doubt. And some, some studies have actually linked the experience of specifically tonic immobility to depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. So it can have significant consequences, even if it is an evolutionarily based survival response. I need to be mindful of time. I always go longer than I thought I would. Um, but the one thing I want to note quickly about the brain during a traumatic event is the two different types of attention that we experience. 
So we experience top-down attention when our prefrontal cortex is at, you know, it's optimal functioning. The amygdala is pretty quiet. Our hormones in our body are level and even where they should be. You should be having top-down experience. You're focusing your actions on your internal guidance of what you need to do, what you need to pay attention to, what are your goals. Again, that planning of what time do I need to get up tomorrow to eat, get dressed, have a cup of coffee and practice the presentation before 10 o'clock. That's all top-down attention. Bottom-up attention is something we experience when we feel threatened or are experiencing trauma. This is when the raw sensory input and um, kind of survival um, drive is the primary like thought process. It becomes less about ability for planning and more about, I just need to get through this moment. So it's based on raw sensory input. It's based on what's happening around you. And it's driven by those external factors and it's involuntary. So usually somebody focuses their bottom up attention on something that's going to be life threatening to them. So somebody may have been mugged and they may have had, the perpetrator may have had a gun and they can describe the gun and the perpetrator's hand perfectly, but they cannot tell law enforcement what they were wearing, what their face looked like, because the brain is so focused on that gun and where that gun is pointing because it is threatening their life, that that is their soul like center of attention versus the surrounding items. That's bottom up attention. And oftentimes in sexual assault, um, if no weapon is used, someone's bottom up attention, or even if there is, is on something random that may not make sense to us or even the survivor. Like, I know there was a case where an individual was, a teacher was assaulted on the desk. And the main thing that she kept saying was how many holes in the ceiling tile there were above her desk. And so it may not make sense, but the the brain often hones in on one thing um, when utilizing that bottom up attention. And again, it just demonstrates that the prefrontal cortex doesn't have control like it normally does in top down everyday optimal functioning. So. The other thing I want to note is just the difference between the brain activity of the survivor and the perpetrator. The brain activity of the perpetrator is not stressed, not necessarily in the additional sense, in the traditional sense. Maybe if they're planning an attack or something, they're a little bit stressed about getting caught, but it's not the same as the survivor's overwhelming amount of fear that they experience during an attack. Um, in contrast, also the prefrontal cortex for the perpetrator is in control. They often have that planning capability. They often know what they're going to say if somebody comes in the room at the time of the assault. Um, they're fully aware and able to kind of plan and think and be reasonable. The survivor's actions are completely out of their control and they're based on survival and what the perpetrator is doing. Again, that bottom-up attention. Um, so you may be wondering what the, the pictures are here, but I always give the example of the, the serial killer, Ed Kemper, who's the picture on the screen. Um, you know, he was he was an individual that, to be short about it, he wanted to be a police officer and they deemed him too big to be a police officer, which I didn't know was a thing. Um, but he was a big guy um, and he was friends with the police. He often hung out with them at the bar that they hung out with. They called him Big Ed. Um, and when he started his um, killings and assaults, he would still go to that bar and he would talk to the police, his friends, about the case. He would hear what leads they were on and he was able to use his prefrontal cortex to plan like, oh, they're on to me in that sense. So I need to change that when I have my next, um, m the next attack. So he's able to plan and think through to prevent himself from getting caught while survivors are and victims are completely overwhelmed by the fear, trauma, and threat to their well-being. Something to be aware of is secondary victimization. This is caused when a survivor just feels re-traumatized really by the system that they have to go through. So, um, you know, this can be talking to law enforcement, even talking to their attorney, getting a sexual assault forensic exam. This doesn't have to be intentional in the part of the provider they're working with. So you as an attorney may not feel like may not be trying to re-traumatize them by asking them questions about what they experienced, by asking them to relive those things. But the act alone of having to retell it and relive it in the moment could cause re-traumatization. So being aware of that and making sure that you're kind of noting when the survivor may be demonstrating some signs of stress and trauma can be really important. 
Retraumatization is, you know, significant when there are those victim blaming behaviors and mistrust and negative judgments by the provider. So you can have good intentions and still cause retraumatization. Try to avoid the um, retraumatization of, you know, those victim blaming questions um, and engaging in some of those victim blaming beliefs that you may not even be aware of. So try and be aware of those because the system itself causes retraumatization. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because I'm short on time, but the being trauma informed when working with the survivor is really important. It helps them feel safe, build rapport, and um, can help you build um, a better case when working with a survivor. So these are the core principles of or values of trauma informed service. So offering safe safety to them. Be mindful if you're meeting with them in person, be mindful of the environment you're meeting somebody in. Be mindful of the access that you give them to a door. I often try and like uh, make sure that when I'm offering somebody a seat, a seat, let them choose where they want to sit um, because they may want to make sure that there are not no nothing or no one is between them and an exit. So safe, worthy, giving them choice um, and empowerment. Um, working with them in a collaborative manner that addresses their cultural, any historical and gender issues. And just being upfront with them, trustworthiness and transparency is very critical um, so that they don't feel betrayed or blindsided at any point. So when working with um, survivors of sexual assault, some general principles for to keep in mind are to understand that there's no perfect or typical victim. Um, and that remembering a sexual details of an assault is, or not remembering details of an assault is perfectly normal and recall may happen over time. So just because they can't remember when they interviewed with police the first day and they remembered a week later, that is perfectly normal as time moves along and the brain kind of comes back to a normal state and somebody's able to easier or better recall information. Some don'ts, and these kind of can be kind of conjunct, these three points can be joined into one, um, really for me, is that don't ask a question, don't ask a why question. Uh, remove why from your vocabulary as best as you can. I guarantee you if you ask a why question right now um, that you may ask a survivor, it can be seen as victim blaming. So try and remove why um, and find alternative means for asking. So can you tell me more about this? Um, or can you describe how that felt to you. Changing the way of your um, questions can be really important. If you have to ask why, try and explain why you're asking that. So for example, if you're saying, I, why were you drinking? Or any victim claiming, blaming question, what were you drinking? Um, those questions can be immediately put a survivor on the defensive of, oh, why does that matter? Um, instead, if you say, I need to know how much you were drinking that night because I wanna look into you know how you may have been able to consent that evening or not. So explaining that question a little bit can go a long way in them understanding why you're asking it. And then of course, do not expect survivors to be able to relate what happened to them in a chronological manner. Let them describe what happened to, to them, ask them follow-up questions and build it from there. When we engage in trauma-informed service, um, we help survivors avoid that secondary victimization or re-traumatization, and it allows us to better be able to do our jobs working with survivors. So that is the end of my presentation. If anyone has any questions, I'll hang around. I'm sorry I'm running right on time, Melissa and Tiffany, but um, happy to any answer any questions. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'd also like to direct everyone's attention to the chat where I just posted the evaluation link for this training. Um, I encourage you all to take a look at it um, and give us any feedback. We greatly appreciate it as we are constantly striving to improve. Um, we are also going to go on a small break right now, um, and we will be back again at 1140 for an overview of laws that govern school response to sexual assault.